Jupiter is an affluent community in Palm Beach County, Florida, a town where million-dollar homes and beautiful subdivisions are very common. Tracy and Timothy Ferreter owned a home in Jupiter, and from the outside, it looked very much like the other homes in the neighborhood. However, there was something very different in this home, specifically in the garage. A structure built with two by fours and sheetrock. It was eight by eight. Some have referred to it as a box, others as a room. It has no windows, but had air conditioning, a door with a lock on the outside. And inside the space was a bed, a small desk, a camera, and a bucket. Prosecutors say this was a box that was used to abuse the Ferreter's adopted son. The defense says this was a room used to keep the boy and his siblings safe. Tonight, we'll take a look at this room, the way it was used, the words and actions of the Ferreters and their son's behavior with our own experts. As we investigate, what happened inside this garage in Jupiter, Florida? I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. This hour, we are talking about the story, the case, the trial that everyone is talking about. Uh, we call it the boy in the box trial here at Court TV. Um, others say, oh, it's not a box, it's a room. Well, that's what the debate is all about. Those are the allegations, though. Those are the allegations. Now, we're not naming um, the boy by his, by his name. Some people are using his initials. I'm just calling him the adopted son of the Ferreters, who are the defendants in this case, Timothy Ferreter, on trial right now. During the opening statement for the defense, though, the defense attorney, and she was very effective in, in the way she tried to uh, focus this jury and narrow the issue, but she said... Parenting is tough, and that is something that anyone who's watching tonight who is a parent or has ever observed parents, maybe at the mall or somewhere else with their children, you know this is true. Parenting is not easy, not by a long shot. It's fulfilling, it's amazing, but it's also difficult, and there are lots of challenges. And those of us who have raped, raised children, you know that each one is different. It's not one size fits all. And, and, you know, you hear a lot about nature versus nurture. I'm, I'm, I'm big on the nature part of that because every child, at least in my house, is wired a little differently. And you have to adjust and you've got to figure out how to take that child as they are and make them successful and have them grow into uh, adults. And it's tough. I agree with the defense. Write that down. I agree with the defense. Um, but you know what else is tough? Growing up is tough. It's not easy being a kid. I, I'll, I'll admit, my life growing up, a lot easier than most. That's because I had amazing parents. I had access to everything I ever needed. Um, I, I was spoiled in, 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 a, in a sense that I had two amazing parents. And they, they spent all the time and effort and focus um, on making sure my life was like amazing. And so I'm spoiled. Not every child uh, isn't, has that, and that's unfortunate, but that's reality. But growing up is tough for kids, not just um, that part of it, but if, if you suffer from anything, whether it's some sort of learning disability or um, perhaps depression or other issues, just going through a puberty and, and peer pressure, and now we've got social media and all these other things, growing up is, is not easy. Now, of course, it was tougher when we were kids, right? That's what we tell them, but it's, it's just not easy. It, it's also, it has its challenges. So when we hear from the defense that parenting is tough, well, so is growing up and being a child. And that can become even more difficult if your parents are not helping you through this process. That's what makes growing up a little bit easier and real easy in my case, but real uh, easier for folks if you have parents who are like doing the right thing. And that's, and that's kind of what this case is about. And the defense admitted that they made some bad choices as parents here. 
but they've also spent some time bringing out the behavioral issues that their adopted son had. So inside this courtroom, it's like turning into a battle of, are these bad parents or a worse child? And, and I don't know how the jury's going to decide all of this, if that's going to be one of the things that they're balancing and looking at. But clearly it is part of the discussion, part of the evidence and the analysis of what is happening and what happened in this house. How did the boy end up in a box or in a room, depending on your perspective, locked from the outside inside that garage? That's what they have to figure out. And what, and what is it? And what is it? Is it is is that box created or that room created to keep people safe or is it to torture this child? That's 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 what this jury has to understand and try to figure out. It's not easy and and it depends how you how you how you see it in your own little filter when you look at this room, right? Is, is this, is this a, a torture, a place where someone's tortured? Or is it a place where, hey, we gotta put him in there because this kid's out of control and we've gotta keep the other three children safe. Not an easy one. Okay, Dr. Wade Myers, psychiatrist, testified today for the prosecution to give us a little more insight into what the adopted son of the Ferreters uh, was, was dealing with and what his conditions had been and what he was diagnosed with kind of gives us sort of a baseline of, of what the Ferreters were, were dealing with in trying to raise this child. Was there any indication in the records you reviewed that the defendant in this case was advised to treat his son how he did? No, there was not. Uh, was there any indication that any medical professional ever told him that he should uh, keep his child in a room in the dark for hours during the day? No. Was there any indication that any medical professional said that the child should be deprived of access to a bathroom? No. Now, I want to talk for a second about uh, some of the specifics um, that you testified to. There was a little bit of a talk about um, the o oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis by uh, Ms. Martin. Was she a, a, a doctor or a clinical licensed social worker? Uh, she's a social worker. Okay. Uh, so that wasn't a diagnosis that was done by a doctor? Correct. Um, in addition, that was in the year, was that what year about thereabouts was that? That, was, that should have been two, 2015 when um, he was, uh, uh, let's see, um, eight. In general, did you see, or were you able to tell how often he was, uh, there was any kind of intervention for that or how often he met that licensed clinical social worker? We're talk, uh, talking about uh, Kathleen Martin. Right. Yes. And that was, I have in my records... Uh, September to November of 2015, when he would have been eight in second grade. So a three-month period. If that, I I, I have doc. I could only find three sessions, the intake, and then a, a couple of those, uh, a couple others. In reviewing of the records that were made available to you, is she the only practitioner that found that oppositional defiant disorder? Uh, Susan Martin in the same year. Uh, a counselor also who saw him uh, very limited notes from from her as well, but she had ODD as a as a diagnosis or possibility. And would that not reflect later on? Was that reflected in the findings of the other uh, people he saw, like in 2018 and 2019, which would be like Dr. Reinbacher? Yeah, he, he focused more on the ADHD. I, I believe ODD may have surfaced. Okay. Now, uh, now, or was he, take a look, was he just reactive attachment disorder and ADHD? Yes. Is there a treatment for oppositional defiant disorder, if it, it in fact is accurate? Yes. Um, does it involve locking a child in a room? No. Would um, it be just therapy and medicine? Yes. Is there any indication that that was pursued for beyond those three appointments that you told us about? No, and that's what I, I just, I could never sort of find a, a reason in, in these couple therapists he went to as to why it just stopped after one or two or three sessions. There was no sort of explanation. It just stopped. 
Three sessions, that doesn't seem like a lot to try to help a child who's suffering from whatever. Um, let's bring in our guest to help us through all of this tonight. Joining us in Orlando, Florida, psychotherapist and CEO of Life Counseling Solutions, Dr. Janie Lacey, in New York, nationally known psychotherapist and host of Talking Live and the Bite Size podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. And in St. Louis, Missouri, licensed mental health and nationally certified clinician specializing in trauma, child abuse and neglect, Sharonda Brown is with us. Great to see everyone tonight. ODD, ODD, Dr. Janie Lacey, what, is, what, what does that mean? How does that, um, how serious is that oppositional defiant disorder? How serious, how common, how does it manifest itself? Oppositional defiance disorders, when we're looking at the child or the teen, right, there's an oppositional with authority, right? You're gonna get some um, pushback when it comes to parenting. But when we look at what we're listening to, there is a lot of different things that parents, if that was the case that they could have done to help their situation, not only therapy and following the therapist who may specialize in oppositional defiance disorder and parent coaching. I mean, there's so many things when that is a true diagnosis that the recommendations would be made by professionals to be able to help them along the development of that child. So let's take a look at what is at the, and there, there it is, at the, the center of this entire trial is this box or room that was built in the garage. I want to take a, a look at it right now. Let's take a look first. And okay, as we look at this, and there's a desk. There's a mattress on the floor. You see where the door is. And then an, an, at the foot of the bed is the bucket. And all of this is being recorded by the camera that is also in there. So as we look at this, what do you see, Dr. Robbie Ludwig? Do you see a place that, do, well, first of all, do you see a room or do you see a box? How would you define this? I see a prison. That's what it looks like to me. Um, that it is a place of isolation, it's separate from the home, uh, and that the whole meaning of this room is, uh, you know, for bad kids, for a bad child, and they're being punished. So uh, just the, the whole idea rubs me the wrong way if you want to be a healthy parent and parent a child, especially if a child has some issues going on. But you, you know what, Dr. Robbie Ludwig? Um... I've been to jails and to prisons, not as an inmate, but as an attorney and as a prosecutor. They actually have bathrooms inside those cells. They don't have buckets. They have actual, like, like you know, toilets and sinks. So it's a little different, but I, I get the idea. This is worse. Yeah, this, this is, is worse. This is worse than a prison room. Yes. Sh Sharonda Brown, when you look at this, does this look like a place where you would keep a child to keep the rest of the family safe, like a safety precaution? We need a room. We've got a child may have ODD, may have uh, reactive detachment disorder, may have some ADHD, um, grabs knives and stuff. Is this a place where we, we can put him to keep everyone else safe? Or does this uh, strike you as a place where someone goes to be disciplined or punished? Absolutely not. It's not a place to keep anyone safe. That's a place you send a child when you want them to be shamed or you want them to be isolated or you want them to feel bad. Discipline is supposed to boost your self-esteem and teach you at the same time. What is that teaching him? What was that teaching him? How effective was that? It seems like it was a space to make him feel bad or make him feel like he was not a part of the family. Let's take a listen to some of the testimony of the adopted child of the Ferris. He testified compelling testimony. Um, and here he is talking about life inside that room or life inside that box. Who controlled that? Uh, my parents, Tim or Tracy. Okay. Were there times that you were in the room in the dark? Yes. Uh, is that at night sometimes? Yes, and also during the day. Okay, so there are periods of time during the day where you would be there in the dark, in the room. Yes. What was it like in the room when the lights were off? Um, it was pitch black, you couldn't see anything. Would you have to feel your way around to yes. see what's going on? Now, did the room have um, a, a bathroom or access to the bathroom? It had a... 
bucket for my um, urine and feces, but that was basically it. Okay. So if you if you were in the room and you were closed in there and you had to use the bathroom, what was your only option? Use the bucket. When you were in Arizona, did you ever have to use the bucket for Arizona for feces? Yes. Uh, did you have to use it for urine? Yes. Because um, you you're, had to urinate in the room on occasion, how how was the did the room smell at all? Yes. What? How did it smell? Uh, I mean, did it, was it bad? Petrid. Okay, here's the room, Dr. Janie Lacey. You've got let's let's presume, okay, that what the defense is going to be arguing here is accurate, that they felt fear for their younger children, that he had been violent to other relatives. He had pushed a, a heavy door on a pregnant relative. He had threatened other ones. He had um, brought box cutters to school. He was you know, gathering up and taking knives from the kitchen, and he wandered around at night. What's the, how does a parent, or what should a parent do if you feel in that situation that your other children may not be safe? You know, in this case, Vinny, if that is true, that the parents truly felt fear and that the other family members were in danger, you know, the question I pose is that, especially from what's reported, having resources, being an educated family, why not get professionals involved that can help intervene, help guide, help you with uh, setting parameters in the family? Because there are these people that are available to them, especially when it comes to adoption process processes and as we are hearing ODD, reactive attachment disorder. So that's my first question that I would always pose to a family um, looking at in, in this situation is why not, if it was that bad, why not get help? Why not get people to come help you, not only with the parent coaching, but with your uh, teenage son in particular? Because there is protocols, there there's coaching, there's a lot of different opportunities that they could have had to help change the behavior if that was truly what was happening in their home. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, um, how, how, and I think a lot of people are thinking about this too as we're watching this trial is, well, is there a way for this family to get the child out of that environment? How damaging would that be? Would it be more damaging to the child if they tried to send him off to some disciplinary type of school, boarding school or military school or some school where they're, they're going to kind of keep him secure. Is that going to be more damaging than keeping him somewhat at home? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, just to go back a little bit, you know, when it comes to childhood disorders, if you have abusive, sadistic parents, then the child is going to act out. And so that piece doesn't seem to be addressed. What part of the parenting and the connection to the child is contributing to these acting out behaviors? And that has to be a part of what's understood. Also, I agree that there was no treatment that was given to this child, no family therapy. There was no desire to seem to understand or treat this child or curiosity as to why is my child acting this way. It just seemed like there was pleasure in punishment and that this child was scapegoated for some reason. Now, maybe he was a tougher child, but that he was scapegoated as the bad one and at some point they enjoyed it. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's why we're all reacting to the case the way we are. All right, Dr. Janie Lacey, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, Sharonda Brown staying with us. Have a lot more questions for them. We're going to talk about some of the other alleged abuse above and beyond just the room slash box itself. Plus, coming up next hour. In Delaware, Ohio, Emily Noble was missing for four months when she was found dead with a USB cord around her neck. Her husband, Matthew Moore, was charged with her murder. He sat in jail for 15 months until his trial. Then, a jury found him not guilty. Tonight, Matthew Moore joins us for a live interview to tell his story of what it was like. 
Florida father accused of locking his son in a box in the garage with a bed, a bucket, and a camera. He was locked in a room for hours at a time. Police say this abuse went unnoticed for years. There are ring videos that the state provided of the child lying. He faces up to 40 years. I'm not sure they're going to be able to justify it. What's going on in this house? The Boy in a Box Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 Central on Court TV. That's uh, Timothy Farrader uh, yelling at his adopted son. Now, the jury is seeing video. It's ring camera video, but uh, because there's a, a minor involved, we're not showing you, and the court's not permitting any of the video to be uh, broadcast. So we're getting the audio from all of this. And then the beeps you hear are a combination of his name and some words that you can't say on television. So we can't see it, but guess who can see all of these videos? Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, and she has this report for us tonight. Vinny, those hours of surveillance video that captured what was happening inside of that room that this child victim, RF, was dealing with day in and day out, it seemed to intrigue the jury and frustrate his foster father and drew some new emotion from his adoptive mother. Tracy Farragher was there in the gallery, and she was dabbing her eyes with tissue, flanked by supporters who sit with her each day in the gallery. We really haven't seen this much emotion from her during this trial until today. She seemed to be most moved by by hearing her husband's voice berating their then 14-year-old son. Now, on the opposite side of the courtroom, there's a man who's now responsible for RF's care. All four of the Ferreter children were removed from their parents' custody due to those charges against them. And this guardian, he appeared agitated, especially when we saw on that video overnight of RF having to use that orange bucket that's in the enclosure to urinate. And then was told by his father the next morning to go pour it out and do it where the neighbors wouldn't be able to see what was going on. That guardian ultimately left the courtroom when we could hear the Ferreters forbidding their son from using the air conditioning unit that was meant to cool that structure in the garage. Don't touch the air conditioning, okay? You have to say that again and again and again and again. Don't ever touch it. The jurors on this case, they were paying attention, but they did seem to get restless after several hours of the surveillance video showing similar days for this child. And this panel of six plus three alternates, they weren't doing a lot of note taking, but Timothy Ferreter was taking copious notes and even moved to a different place in the courtroom so that he could make sure to see all of the state's evidence in front of this jury. Vinny. Julia Janae down in Palm Beach County covering all this for us. Now, I want you to take a listen. This, again, this is going to be the audio. We can't show you the video. But here, um, Timothy and Tracy Farrader both yelling at their adopted son some allegations of stealing. Take a listen. Tell me something. Tell me what. Don't tell me what. This is your one chance. Don't look at me like Tell me something or not? Uh, I have a nightmare. Yeah, from where? Uh, blue van. Where? Uh, green van. Steven? Green van. Steven again? What the fuck is wrong with you? You're feeling disappointing. Chocolate? You got so much stuff in your room. You're just such, such a disappointment. We're going to lose. I'm going to take you out of that school. Deal. Okay? You're gonna steal from a house? You'll be done with school. You'll be in here 
homeschooling. I told you that's a possibility. So go ahead and test me tomorrow by going to school and misbehaving or doing a you shouldn't do. Test me. Let's bring back in our experts, Dr. Janie Lacey, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, and Sharonda Brown. Uh, Sharonda, what are you hearing there? Are you hearing parenting or are you hearing abuse? I'm hearing more abuse. The interesting part about these diagnoses is that reactive attachment disorder is really one that occurs when a child feels a break in natural biological parenting. And what happens is they'll go into a home, such as a foster home or adoptive care, and the reality is they really truly want the love. But at some point, they'll feel like they're betraying their biological parents, so they'll react in a way that says, I don't want to betray my parents biologically, so I'm not going to accept your love, but I really want it. So if the child was given love consistently, it's very possible with that diagnosis that that child could have had a successful upbringing. But it sounds like they wanted to ostracize him even more and abuse him even more than what they were already doing. It definitely doesn't sound like parenting as it sounds like more abuse. Okay, now I've got one more to play uh, for everyone. Here they are talking about this air conditioner, okay? Let's not forget where they are. Jupiter, Florida, okay? For those of you who don't know where it is, that's like South Florida, the, the part that gets very warm. Let's listen. Did you turn the air on in your room? Yes. Are you supposed to touch that? Did you hear Baba? Yes. Did you hear his question? No. Are you supposed to touch air conditioning? No. Why did you touch it? So it's getting hot. I don't give a if it's getting hot. You're a tough guy. You don't touch the air conditioning. I'll deal with you tomorrow on that. Looks like the air conditioner is the wire hanger of this trial, uh, Dr. Janie Lacey. Don't touch the air conditioner. Um, what are you hearing in, in, the, in the tone? And, and, you know, there could be people at home right now saying, well, you know what, this kid's not following rules and, you know, voices get raised, voices get raised in houses across America. Um, how do you, how, what are you hearing in, in the way Tim and Tracy are speaking with or yelling at or going back and forth with their son? Well, there's context. So when we're looking at or someone's watching and listening, just looking at that, okay, the child was not listening and the parents are upset and they're frustrated. But we're looking at the whole context of the case, right? We're hearing their con control. This child was put in an adverse situation. Logically, I live in Florida. It's hot. You want to turn on the AC because you probably won't be able to sleep. There's probably some consequences for sleeping and not having um, access to uh, AC. So logically a child would especially if they had access would want to make themselves cooler in and of itself there's nothing wrong with that but there's this long lingering threat and this um, frustration almost this um, almost treating it like it's an adverse situation so looking at the totality of their um, parenting and as we were listening earlier and the, the yelling and the out of control and the berating so we put it all into context it's probably the lesser of what we've experienced which is probably why someone could to make um, a simple judgment in its um, isolation that it's just a, a normal reaction to a child not listening. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, um, as we listen to the voices and then we see the reactions of the parents inside the courtroom and of course what Julie Janae described to us, what do you think is going on with the parents right now? Well, I'm sure they're embarrassed and ashamed. And of course, what strikes me so much is how the parents look so much like each other. They almost could pass for sister and brother. And then you hear they adopted this Vietnamese child who might be a little bit difficult due to, you know, the circumstances with which he came from. And I hear a lot of the, not me, this child is not like me and is being punished as a result for not being like them, not looking like them, not behaving the way they thought he would behave. And so this child is not mirroring back to them that they are good parents. And he is getting very punished for that. And it just seems like there's a lot of rage. They don't know how to deal with a difficult or troubled child. And it just uh, seems like they're making it worse and getting into a power struggle. 
uh, there is help, you know, for parents who are having trouble with, with kids. And uh, it just seems like they took matters into their own hands, did what felt the easiest, was, which was to be sadistic and cruel and separate this child and prove their rightness. They weren't interested in the child's mental health or well-being. All right, everyone staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the other part of this case, which is the behavior of the adopted son. We'll hear some of it, and we'll hear a lot of it described. How does that play into the equation here? We'll talk about it when we come back. There's a tragic outcome in this case. Civil trial that is the focus of the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. How a misdiagnosis tore their family apart. They continue to accuse Jack and Beata of being child abusers. Jack called me and said Beata just hung herself. Is the hospital they're suing responsible for what happened? The Take Care of Maya trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Do you remember kicking a ball at another student repeatedly? Do you have a name for the student? I don't. Um, I think I do, yes. Okay. Do you remember putting your finger and thumb and pushing up a, on a boy's throat and pushing him up against the wall at Immaculate Heart? Yes. I think they also, you brought a box cutter to school? Uh, yes, that was at Basis Charter Schools. Oh, that was at Basis? How did your parents respond to that? They locked me in my room. So there was some of the um, instances of the behavior in this case that the jury is hearing and some of the things that, according to the defense, created the basis for um, locking him in this box slash room in the garage and keeping him away from the younger children in the family and everyone else to keep everyone safe because he's very violent. Now. The jury also got to hear today, and they got to see, but there wasn't much to see because the room was dark, um, an outburst uh, by the adopted son where he is screaming inside of this room. I'm going to play that for you now. Again, you won't see it, uh, but there wasn't much to see because the, the, the room is dark at this point, but let's listen. So the other noise you hear is him breaking things. So Sharonda Brown, uh, what did you hear in, in, in what we just played for everyone? I heard a child or a youth that's in distress. Our main core things that we need when we're born are physiological needs met, we have to have emotional and physical safety, and we have to have a good sense of intimacy. If those things are disrupted, a person will spend the rest of their lives trying to get it. So imagine a youth whose brain is not fully developed, who may have some trauma, which stunts the growth of his brain, as well as puts him in a space of survival constantly. They will begin to, at some point, act out. And if he's being physically abused in the process of trying to develop that emotional safety, he's learning to be abusive himself. So he's not even given a chance. It sounds like he is in survival and in complete distress when I hear him yelling and screaming and when I hear about all the things, um, the behaviors that he may have engaged in. It really breaks my heart. Let's hear some of those other alleged behaviors. This is from Sev D. Borzati, who is a friend of the defendant who testified today, uh, talking about things that um, were witnessed. Let's take a listen. There was an incident in the pool where, you know, would be overly aggressive, um, duck, the, duck the children underwater and, and hold them down there for a little bit and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, I was there, so um, I was there to protect and look after them, but I, I wouldn't have left my children alone if it was just <laughs> the kids. So don't, don't kids play like that, putting their heads underwater, that sort of thing? Oh, I think when both of them 
choose to do it together and they play. This was more just one pushing the other down against their will. Uh, going back to Sedona for a moment, was there, was there ever an incident there that happened with that caused you concern? Uh, when we were leaving and we were packing up and, and I guess checking the house before we left, we noticed there, there were knives missing from the, uh, from the kitchen. Um, so we started to look for those to make sure we put those back and, and find out where they were. Uh, we couldn't find them. Uh, and then Tracy uh, went into bag to have a look and uh, found the knives and brought them back. Uh, and we put, those, we put those away. So there was probably a handful of knives um, that were missing and uh, found in my bag. Would you have left your kids with unsupervised? Objection relevance. Absolutely not. Overall. I'm sorry, sir? Absolutely not. And why not? Uh, I would think it would un be unsafe. So one of the other issues here, you have this behavior but you also have what's happening to him. And what is the relation between the two? Like, because of the bad behavior, are the parents putting him in this box? Or is putting him in the box, um, you know, putting him in a position where he starts to act out and, and engage in this bad behavior? Uh, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, I'll give you the first uh, crack at that one. Yeah, I mean, if you just look at sibling rivalry and the competition that could go on, this kid is being separated, scapegoated, uh, and that would increase the aggressiveness and resentment that he has towards his siblings. Having said that, I can see where the parents may have been worried about their other children and felt unsafe. But the way that they handled it is making this child worse. And, and that's the problem here. We're not saying that the child doesn't have issues. We're just saying that the, the treatment of this child as a result of his problems made him worse, made him shameful, made him act out in extreme ways. And if the parents were concerned, there are other avenues to go other than um, you know, treating your child probably worse than you treat a dog, really, is what we're seeing here. Dr. Janie Lacey, how about the level of danger here? Once you start talking about knives and box cutters and things like that, it, it seems like it's potentially serious. We cover cases where we see children go bad and act out in school and create incredible harm. We've seen um, children do it to siblings. We've seen it, them do it to classmates. It's, it's, and when, once I start hearing about collecting knives from a kitchen, I guess they're on a, in a vacation home and, and grabbing the knives, what, what are your thoughts about handling and dealing with and what it means in the overall picture of, of the dynamic in this family? Well, if he truly has clinically been diagnosed with ODD, we know there's going to be bad behavior. We know that there's going to be the pushback on the parenting. There could be vindictive behavior. There could be anger and resentment to the point where it's acting out in multiple ways. So if the parents truly felt not safe, my first call to action would be how can they get the help to problem solve to create safety in their home versus their behavior you know as my colleagues have mentioned Look, can i ask you this can i ask you this because when they were in arizona or i think in one of their prior homes they were locking him in his room at night inside the house then they had another baby and they needed another room for another child, that's when they initially moved him to the garage in Arizona. What are your thoughts about having the child in the house but locking him in at night inside the house, not in the garage, but in, a, in his room in the house? You know, my thoughts would be if they truly did feel fearful, they could have had their newborn baby sleeping in the room with them. They could have locked their door. And as you suggested, they could have still kept him in the family unit in the main area, but created some um, opportunities to be vigilant and watching his behavior, including if there truly is a fear of um, harm, removing objects, locking him in the room, putting a camera, watching his door. I mean, there were so many other options that they 
probably could have executed before putting him in a garage in a lock room. And then as we've heard through some of the testimony, him having a fear of the dark and then putting him in the dark and just exasperating the situation, which probably caused more potential behavioral issues. So it's sad to hear that it's almost like this 14 year old, his 14 year old self is put on trial for everything that he's probably even had gone through um, in this situation up until this point where there has to be some responsibility taken for bad parenting and bad behavior and that there were other choices that they had that truly could have helped them if that truly was their concern. Sharonda Brown, how about keeping the younger children in the house safe? I think for every problem or every concern, there is a solution. And there are ways to keep everybody safe without ostracizing or making one person believe that they are the problem or that they are the unsafe measure. Just like all of my other colleagues stated, there are so many ways to get help. There are so many, so many interventions. There are so many people to call to say, hey, we need some help here. This child is violent. We don't trust him around our other children. There are so many other interventions. But it sounds like the efforts that they went into, they put into making him feel more abused, had they put those efforts into actually getting him help? Because when I hear you say three sessions and nothing else, another clinician, three sessions, nothing else, no other interventions, but you went out your way to create this space so that he could be ostracized and that he can continue to be abused, the amount of anger. Keep in mind, children will rather take negative attention over none at all. So if he believed the only way I can get these people to speak to me, see me, hear me, is to increase my defiant behaviors, then he's gonna do it. It's a win for him. So I think that when he talked about keeping everybody safe, we're not just talking about physical safety, but emotional safety, because at some point, those other children would have been unsafe, hearing, seeing, watching it, because acute trauma is still a thing as well. So people can actually experience those traumatic effects by watching and hearing everything that has gone on. Even if they've never abused their own children, watching their parents treat him that way is still abuse to them as well. So let's talk about safety because they weren't safe from their own parents either, it sounds like, not just this child. Dr. Jenny Lace, we have about 20 seconds here. What do you think the long-term prognosis is for this child? He's out of that house now. Does he have an opportunity, do you think, to have some sort of a normal adulthood? He absolutely has an opportunity if he gets the right support system around him, the right guidance, the right guidance, accountability also if he truly has mental health disorders. So accountability, the right guidance, the right opportunities, and all of the things that can help him have that propelling him forward to find the sweet spots for him in life. I absolutely believe that there is redemption in his case.